Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello, we are going to continue our discussion on block equations. In our previous lecture, we saw that the block equations in the presence of a magnetic field and an oscillating magnetic field which rotates in the x y plane, the time dependence of the magnetization is given by these three differential equations. for the x component this is for the y component and this is the z component. Let us briefly recapitulate how we arrived at these three differential equations. Here this is the z1 magnetic field pointing along z direction and b1 is the amplitude of the oscillating magnetic field which is rotating in the xy plane with an angular velocity omega here. How we arrived at this one? We first have this time dependence of the magnetization in the magnetic field given by this equation. Now, when only magnetic field that is present here is the Zeeman field, then this gives us this simple differential equation, and then Bloch introduces the relaxation of this. 3 magnetization in this fashion that is m x and m y decays with time constant of t 2 and m z increases with t 1 to bring the non Boltzmann magnetization to the equilibrium magnetization here. Then the total magnetic field that the magnetization experiences is due to the external magnetic field B 0 and the oscillating magnetic field B 1 cos omega t in the x component B 1 sin omega t is the y component this is the total magnetic field then we get these three equations. Now, here this x small x small y and small z these are the laboratory fixed x y z coordinate and in particular the B 0 the z 1 field is applied along the z direction. So, to solve this one, one can of course, use the mathematical techniques of first order differential equation and solve them. 
that is possible, but uh, somehow it is not very illuminating. So, we are going to solve this differential equation in a different way using a special technique called rotating coordinate system. This technique is very much used in magnetic resonance. Suppose I have got a coordinate system, let us call it capital X, Y and Z and uh, this is rotating in a certain direction may be. Let us I have say I have got this capital X and Y and Z a coordinate system which is rotating about an axis at a certain angular velocity omega. So, in this rotating coordinate system how is the equation of motion of any vector going to change? Let us first learn that. Suppose I have got a vector f which is a function of time. So, this could be written as in terms of our usual coordinate system which is my let us say laboratory coordinate system which is x, y and z. They are of course, fixed with respect to space and this is the vector which has got 3 components in this coordinate system. This is i in the vector j and this is the unit vector k. So, time dependence of this is given by the time derivative of each of this component here. Nothing new is happening here. This is i, j, k and uh, three little vectors fixed along this x, y and z direction. So, rate of change of this with respect to time is given by the corresponding rate of change of these three components of the vector along these three directions. But now, we want to be more general and suppose now this coordinate system is rotating in a certain direction and angular velocity omega around this axis. How is this time derivative going to look like with respect to these coordinates little x, y and z which are rotating now? That is the exercise we are going to do now. So, how does the motion of a vector appear with respect to a rotating coordinate system? So, it is a type of relative velocity or relative motion. So, so let us say I have got the coordinate system again x, y and z and this is the vector pointing in certain direction. So, it is a question of relative motion. If I sit on this coordinate system the vector itself will appear to rotate that is understandable that with respect to the vector this coordinate system is rotating means with respect to the coordinate system the vector is rotating. So, it is a matter of 
uh, rotation of the vector, how that appears with respect to a static coordinate system. So, let us say that this is the direction of the angular velocity omega and from certain origin this vector r is pointing. So, as I said earlier the rotation of the coordinate system is as good as imagining that the vector r is rotating around the direction of this angular velocity omega. Okay. Suppose at the time t this was here and then it is rotating in this way. So, after some time this will appear here, but this vector is different from this vector because the direction has changed, magnitude has not changed, it is rotating in this way. So, the change here is I call it dr, so, this is actually equal to r plus dr. What will be the magnitude of this dr? So, if this angle is theta, then if I draw a normal here, this normal there. So, at time dt, the change in the sort of amplitude of this is d. R. So, what is dr by dt? So, from this angle, this magnitude is r cos theta, and this magnitude is r sin theta. So, if the angular velocity is omega, then at with time dt, this angle put it here, this angle d alpha will be this is actually equal to d alpha. This is the angular velocity at time dt, this much angle is formed here. So, this will be given by this is the radius and this is the angle. So, this will be given by r sin theta d alpha. So, this is therefore is equal to dr by dt is r sin theta d alpha by dt which is equal to r sin theta omega that is straightforward. So, this rate of change of this is equal to r sin theta times the angular velocity. So, this gives the magnitude of this. Now, we have to also worry about the direction of that this direction d r this incremental vector is in the direction which is normal to r at every instant of time and also normal to this direction of angular velocity omega. If I write that properly using the vector algebra this will look like d r by d t is actually equal to this. So, this gives the correct magnitude as well as sorry r sin theta omega. So, this gives the correct magnitude as well as the sense of this direction. Now, coming back to the our rotating coordinate system when this rotates I have another set of coordinates, let us call it x, y and 
z is uh, they are rotating to certain axis the angular velocity vector omega then this little each of them will have its own i j and k and these little vectors they keep on changing with time. So, I can therefore write using this equation d i by d t is this r vector is replaced by this in vector i. Similarly, and and k. So, once again that you should not get confused with respect to the fixed coordinate x, y and z I have get its own little i, j and k which are fixed with respect to the laboratory fixed coordinate let us say. But the other coordinate capital X and Y and Z they are rotating in certain direction with an angular velocity omega. Then the unit vector associated with this rotating coordinate system is this I and J and K and they have got this sort of time dependence. So, now coming back here now we can now make it more general by saying that this I, J and K also depends on time in this fashion because of the rotation with respect to this. Uh, certain direction with omega then I can write in more general way that f is i times f x j times f y k times f z but now this time that I got with respect to the fixed coordinate x y and z. Now, if i and j k they are also changing because with rotation then I have to use another term here which is the rate of change of this with respect to time. So, this will be f of x d i by d t plus f of y d j by d t plus f of z d k by d t. So, this gives the complete time derivative where the coordinate system is also rotating. Now, I already got this relationship this in terms of the angular velocity vector omega. So, if I write this here this will look like i d f s y d t plus here f x times this is omega cross i. Now, we can collect all the terms that involve this omega. This gives dt plus the omega term i f x j f y k f z. See how 
all these things have come together and this is nothing but this vector itself. So, we can write this is equal to I d f x by d t j d f y by d t k d f z by d t plus omega cross f. These three terms written as del f by del t and this is omega cross f. So, this is the same as d f by d t. So, this is the equation we are trying to arrive at. What is the significance of this? This says that this part is the time derivative with respect to the rotating coordinates which are rotating around this axis with an angular velocity omega. So, where this i j k the unit vectors are rotating with respect to those rotating unit vectors this is the time derivative and this is with respect to the space fixed unit vector i j k. So, it also shows that if this term is 0 then with respect to the rotating coordinate system the three component of this vector f do not change. So, so, this is the equation we will find very useful. So, another way to look at it is that if I want to know the time derivative with respect to a rotating coordinate system that derivative plus this vector product together gives the time derivative with respect to the space fixed coordinate. From here now we will try to see how the magnetization can be written in terms of rotating coordinate system and its time dependence can be derived in exactly say analogous fashion. This is the differential equation relating the rate of change of magnetization in the presence of magnetic field here. So, you see from this I can straight away write if the that in a coordinate system which is rotating with an angular velocity omega this will look like this this is the extra term that comes from here because of the rotation coordinate system. So, this is the time independence of the magnetization in the rotating coordinate system and I get the extra term here and that is the way it is going to be. So, what does it mean? This means minus omega cross m which is this gives me
compare now this equation with this equation. This is written in terms of the laboratory switch coordinate system and this is in terms of a coordinate system which is rotating in an arbitrary direction with an, ang an angular velocity omega. So, you see they look essentially very very similar except that this effective B becomes different in the rotating coordinate system different from the magnetic field B that is present here. So, when the coordinate system rotates with an angular velocity omega, the effective magnetic field becomes this. So, and then I can use the essentially the same type of time dependence as in the static coordinate system. So, with this now you see how easy to visualize the motion of this magnetization in a magnetic field. So, when the, the my B was B 0 k and I want now find out the time dependence of the magnetization. If I choose a coordinate system which is rotating around the z axis with an angular velocity this, then what happens that if I choose the frequency such a way that the effective becomes 0, then my dm by dt becomes exactly 0. So, that means that in the coordinate system which is rotating around the z direction with a frequency omega such that this is 0 or in other words my this implies that omega is actually equal to gamma b 0. Then in that rotating coordinate system the magnetization does not change. So, it appears static. So, what is the consequence of that? If the magnetization appears static in a coordinate system which is rotating at a frequency omega around the z axis, then in a static coordinate system the magnetization rotates with the same frequency. See how nicely we come to the conclusion which we drew earlier is that magnetization precesses in the laboratory coordinate system with this frequency and when you look at the rotating coordinate system rotating with this frequency the magnetism appears static the picture is the same. So, this conclusion comes so easily by choosing a coordinate system which rotates in this particular fashion. So, this is the advantage of using rotating coordinate system. We get a better insight and expressions also look somewhat simpler. So, how will the block equation look like in the rotating coordinate system. Now, what is the rotating coordinate system we should choose here? Here we chose the frequency which is the Larmon frequency, but for this situation where this B1 is the micromagnetic field which is rotating in the xy plane, in this fashion I choose a coordinate system which is rotating in the same angular frequency as this one along the z direction that is it will be having an angular frequency omega and direction is the z direction. Then what will happen to the V1 field in the laboratory coordinate system the magnetic field is rotating in this way 
but if the coordinate system now I have got this. which is rotating in the same frequency as this one then this v1 field will appear static now. So, at time t equal to 0 if the v1 field is applied along this x direction and the coordinates will start rotating at time t equal to 0 from the x direction then in the rotating coordinate system the v1 will always be along the x direction there will not be any y component for that. So, we can therefore write it very easily from this knowledge that with when a coordinate system rotates I change the b by this and here in particular the b 1 also has only the one component it is the x and y component. So, here let us I modify right here so that the difference becomes easy to visualize this will become b 0 minus omega y gamma e m y. So, this is the change of b 0 value that is the way we come we got the answer earlier. Now, this is the y component of the magnetization in the laboratory coordinate system, but in the rotating coordinate system this is absent. So, this becomes 0 minus now I should call it now t m x by d t this is the capital dmx by dt to indicate that this is the rotating coordinate system. Similarly, for y component d m y by dt will be again b 0 will be replaced by this one. Yeah, I should have changed this also this will be capital Y the rotating coordinate system. This is the B 1 magnetic field which is always present in the x direction. So, this will be present here is a mistake here this so, will be T 2 and finally this is capital Z this is again the y component of the rotary magnetic field which is not present in this coordinate system this is 0 this will be T 1. See how easily we can now transform the this laboratory coordinate system that magnetization evolves to a rotating coordinate system. So, I have got a slide here. So, now, the capital X, Y and Z are the rotating coordinate system and then now the total magnetic field appears only as the X component of the microwave and the Zeeman field is along the Y I am sorry in the z direction and then this is the change time dependence of the x, y and z direction. Now, we will try to get the steady state solution of the Rock equation. When the EPR experiment is done all the time dependence have reached a steady state value and this when the spectrum is recorded as a function of either frequency or magnetic field we get the steady state value of the magnetization that is detected by the spectrometer. We can solve for the steady state value of the magnetization from this three differential equation by setting this time derivative to be 0 d m x by d t is 0 d m y by d t equal to 0 d m z by d t equal to 0. Then we do some algebra and the solution is given in this fashion.
this is called the steady state solution of block equation in the rotating coordinate system. Here we have made a small substitution gamma e b 0 is defined to be omega 0 and delta omega is omega 0 minus omega. This omega is the angular frequency of the micromagnetic field and this is the frequency corresponding to the Zeeman field or Larmor frequency that is the way it looks like. So, now EPR spectrometer can be set to detect the MX component of the magnetization or MI component of the magnetization. Usually we look at the MI component which is called the out of phase component because out of phase respect to the this rotating magnetic field which is present there which is applied in the x direction. So, we are looking at the y 1 which is 90 degree out of phase, but one can detect the x component also which is the in phase component. Now, how they will differ the appearance is given by this magnetization as a function of now the frequency of the microwave magnetic field that is this omega. So, if I plot this that will give the EPR line say. As I said that, that usually the MI component is detected. So, EPR line shape will be given by the shape of this. If we plot now MI as a function of omega, what we are plotting is this function in the that is the MI in the rotating coordinate system. This will look like this, where this peak corresponds to omega 0. So, this is called the absorption profile or absorption spectrum. Similarly, if we plot the M x component, this will look like this. This is called the dispersion spectrum. Usually, this is detected in the EPS spectrometer. MI is proportional to If here if we neglect this term gamma square b 1 square t 1 t 2 if that is neglected that is very very small at the 1 then it looks like this. Now, this is exactly similar to the form y equal to 1 by 1 plus x square which is the power and So, the EPR absorption spectrum will therefore appear Lorentzian when this term is neglected. Now here, see when x is equal to 1, the value of y becomes half. The same way, here when omega 0 minus omega t 2 is equal to 1, then the signal height becomes half of that. So, here this will be half of that when this value is 1 by t 2. Similarly, here also will be 1 by t 2 or in other words this total this one if I call delta omega half corresponds to the half intensity of this one or full width at half maxima 
who knew it that half maxima corresponds to delta omega half this gives 2 y t 2. So, when the spectrum are recorded as function of frequency we can straight away get the spin spin relaxation time from this relationship. Okay. The second consequence of this block equation here see the intensity of this m y is proportional to b 1 which is the measure of the micromagnetic field. When b 1 increases the signal height will also increase is proportional to b 1, but microwave power is p then p is proportional to b 1 square. So, when the EPR signal is recorded at various setting of microwave power the intensity will change as square root of power. All these are true when we have neglected this factor this one, but as you keep on increasing the microwave power this becomes more and more significant and it is possible that this may not be neglected. Then the line shape will start showing distortion. So, we call this signal when this becomes appreciable then this appears here as comma square q 1 t 2. So, the signal will now try to become smaller and smaller because this is becoming appreciable. We have got b 1 here, but then as this becomes larger then this signal will start therefore, initially keep going up and then because of this it will start going down. So, we say that it, the system is undergoing partial saturation that is relaxation process is not able to maintain the population difference well. So, signal height goes down. But this itself could be used as a tool to measure the spin lattice relaxation time. How? So, let us call this factor saturation factor. So, if I plot the signal height now as a function of various settings of B 1 as I said initially it will go up and then it will start coming down because of this one. So, by plotting the intensity as function of microwave power I can get an idea of this value saturation factor. So, this is proportional to B 1 square. So, from that experiment I get idea of this product now and then I can get T 1 by knowing that from the unsaturated condition when the line shape was strictly Lorentzian and particular power is small I can get T 2 when partial saturation is achieved I can get T 1 and T 2 from this I can find out T 1 also. But this technique of measuring that spin as relaxation time is called continuous wave saturation technique. Now, to measure the T 1 and T 2 from this line shape analysis one needs to keep in mind that the line shape should follow Lorentzian that means there should not be any unresolved hyperbola line the each hyperbola line must strictly correspond to one transition there is no residual line which are hidden here in that case one will get wrong value of T 2 and if you get wrong value of T 2 you will get of course wrong value of T 1 because this is obtained from the product of T 1 and T 2 and also one has to have very accurate measurement of the micromagnetic field B 1 and that is not very easy to know unless one makes very careful estimate of B 1. We can measure the microwave power very accurately, but how is that microwave power forming a standing wave inside the cavity and how the B 1 field is experienced by the sample that needs very very careful measurement that is not a very easy task. Nevertheless, this way of measuring T 1 and T 2 are possible if one takes care of these things. Now, 
Before concluding, a little small note of uh, importance that we do not do the experiment in terms of micro frequency. We do the experiment at fixed micro, micro frequency, but vary the magnetic field. So, we modify this block equation which are here in terms of uh, fixed micro frequency to vary the magnetic field. So, that is shown here. The so steady state solution of block equation in the rotating coordinate system in terms of variable magnetic field here. Looks eco they are quite equivalent, of course. So, now to conclude that we have seen how the introduction of relaxation by block in the time dependent uh, magnetization gives rise to the line shape and it explains a host of things like saturation behavior, how the T1 and T2 are intrinsically built into the line shape and one can learn from and one can measure those from the line shape analysis. With this we come to the end of this lecture.